is Fiona Duguid and uh, Jose Charbonneau, and we are from Co-op Convert. And today we're going to be talking with you about converting to a co-op, and maybe this is something you hadn't thought about. Jose? Hi everyone. Uh, so as Fiona just told, uh, my name is Jose Charbonneau. As you may guess from my name, I do speak French <laughs> in everyday life. And so uh, I am a uh, research professional at IRICUS, which is an institute uh, uh, that does research and education about cooperatives, and we're located in Quebec. Uh, so uh, thank you for participating today. Thanks, Jose. Um, yes, and my name is Fiona Dugan, and I am with a, the, on the team um, that is out of University of Toronto um, in um, a partnership agreement with SHRC, and uh, SHRC is the Social Sciences and Research Council of uh, Canada. And we um, are working with um, a number of universities. I'm just going to advance the slide. Um, uh, including um, with the Toronto uh, University of Toronto Center for Learning and Social Economy at Work. Um, and as Jose mentioned, we're also working with your troops at University of Sherbrooke. And also, our community partner is uh, Co-ops and Mutuals Canada, CMC. Um, and as I said, this is um, a research project that has been sponsored by SHRC um, from the Government of Canada. I'm just going to back up the slide there so you can see the agenda. I, just so you know where our roadmap is heading us today. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about what a co-op is. For some of you, you might be familiar with this already. Um, then we're also going to jump into some examples of um, conversions to co-ops from other kinds of business structures within the agricultural sector. And then we're going to jump into some of those benefits and some of the challenges and then move towards resources. Um, so just so uh, you can get a little more information about our project, this is focused in the area of co-ops. And um, one of the big reasons why we've decided to take a look at this is the uh, great potential um, for good or for bad of um, uh, large scale closures of um, small and medium enterprises across Canada uh, due to the growing numbers of retirees. Um, of, of the owners of these businesses. And I'm sure as many of you know, this is also not something that's dissimilar within the agricultural industry. Um, so our big job um, in, as a part of this sort of consortium of research groups and community organizations is to better understand the opportunities um, that are opening up um, for the business to co-op conversion. Um, as part of that bigger picture succession planning opportunities and options for, um, for business owners and for Canadians who are looking to um, take up those, those different types of, those businesses in different types of uh, ways. I'm going to turn it over to Jose. <clears throat> Thank you, Fiona. Uh, so we just wanted to show you uh, the first uh, first results we found in our uh, co-op convert project. Uh, mainly, what we found is that uh, all the numbers you see over there are into, uh, businesses, private businesses that transformed into a cooperative as a way of succession, essentially. And so uh, you can see that there. Are some cases that happened uh, almost everywhere uh, through Canada, and that there are a lot of them <laughs> happening in Quebec. Mostly one of the things we can uh, consider is that there are more cooperatives in Quebec than in many other provinces of Canada. And so this conversion process reflects the reality, in fact, of the uh, uh, co co cooperative presence in Quebec. Next. And so one of the things we found is that there, there exist different models for cooperative cooperatives, and we will see each of them in a little more details uh, in a few slides. But for now, uh, what we wanted to show is that from all the 200 conversions that we observed uh, and shown in the last uh, slide, 
you can see that there are consumer co-ops which are held by the consumers. There are worker co-ops, so employees taking uh, the, the, the business for which they are currently working, producer co-ops, uh, and also multi-stakeholder co-ops, which, uh, which combine different types of members into the cooperatives. There is another aspect, in another type of cooperative, which is a worker shareholder co-op, uh, but it's only in Quebec, and we won't talk about this uh, for, for this presentation. Make it. So one of the main questions before going further on is what's a co-op? Um, maybe we can go already to the next slide, Fiona. Um, the, a simple way to put it is that cooperatives are people-centered enterprises that are owned, controlled, and run by their members and for their members. And so to realize their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations. So what that means is that different pers uh, persons having the same, uh, the same uh, needs, let's say in terms of economic uh, activities, like having access to uh, food in their village, for example, their town, uh, they can join together and form a cooperative so as to uh, um, have access to that food on their own. And so they own it, they control it, and they also run it uh, by and for the members. Just to let you uh, know a big picture of agricultural co-ops, mainly here uh, in Canada, uh, we can found, oh, well, there, there's 100, 260 <laughs> agricultural co-ops in Canada. And so this is quite a large number of co-ops. Uh, the agricultural cooperative represents a big, big, big part, in fact, of the cooperative sector in Canada. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, the assets and sales are uh, quite impressive for these agricultural co-ops. And they, uh, they are owned and controlled by 500, uh, 520,000 um, <laughs> 520, members, is that it, Fiona? Phew. And 30,000 30, people are employed in these agricultural co-ops also in Canada. So all these statistics are for agricultural co-ops in Canada only, which means that um, many people are involved in it and that uh, the, they, they produce a lot of uh, uh, economic uh, turnover into uh, their activities. So some of these co-ops you may know, um, some of them uh, are Canada widespread, are widespread across Canada, uh, like Agrooper has some activities uh, uh, is based in Quebec, but has some activities in other provinces, so maybe you saw it, but uh, if not, maybe you know about the different co-ops. Uh, the same logo is used a few, uh, at a few locations, so maybe you've seen it already in your neighborhood. Uh, and if not, these are only a small sample of agricultural co-ops that are in Canada, but we try to pick some maybe logos you could recognize uh, easier, uh, more, more, more easily, so that you get an idea that there are co-ops all around you, probably. Next, Fiona. Okay, so as we mentioned uh, just a few slides back, there are different types of co-ops, and here we can see the main char characteristics of these co-ops. So the consumer co-ops is probably one of the most uh, frequent one uh, in Canada. And in fact, this is where cons consumers join together to get access to a service or different products. And so they decide to, uh, to create a consumer co-op. The example I told uh, just uh, before was about that kind of cooperative, so consumers wanting to have access to food in their municipality so they can join together and form a co-op. Another case that is uh, frequent is the worker co-op. This is where the employees of the cooperatives own the cooperatives also. So they join together to create their job and, find, and get, call, get control uh, onto it. 
Uh, many sectors are represented in this case. Uh, in Quebec, I know there's mostly forest uh, forestry cooperatives, but um, there can be in services and engineering, etc. So mostly these are co-ops owned by the workers. Uh, just quick, a uh, quick uh, uh, return on the consumer co-ops. You can uh, think about the shops that offer services. But you can think also of the credit unions as consumer co-ops. And also in the housing uh, sector, there are quite a lot of housing co-ops. So just so you know uh, where they are. Um, another type of co-op would be the producer co-op. This is a uh, cooperative that is owned by uh, producers. This would be uh, a model that is uh, frequent in the agricultural co-ops model. So, uh, for example, a farmer uh, or um, someone owning a farm would be a member of that cooperative, and so they can send whatever they produce, let's say milk for the example, uh, so they can send their milk to the cooperative. So every producer sends their milk to the, the cooperative that will transform it and put it on the market. It could be the other way around. It could be also that the co-op offers services to help uh, the agricultural activities. So they would uh, maybe offer con console services, et cetera. So this, is, this would be the producer co-op. Uh, and uh, for example, we saw it uh, just before, Agropur would be a producer co-op, <clears throat> for example. And the MU2 stakeholder co-op, as I mentioned earlier, is one that is formed with different groups of these uh, other types of members. So maybe there could be consumer and workers owning, co uh, owning together the cooperative, or producer, consumer, worker. Etc. And sometimes you may find uh, some members from the community that join this multi-stakeholder co-ops also to uh, for, for because they benefit from it. So we can go to the next slide. One of the uh, main subject of today would be some conversion. Maybe if you thought about uh, going. Uh, going through uh, retirement and you want to um, sell your uh, your farm or your uh, or you want to integrate to agricultural activities this could be an option for you so converting the business into a cooperative for you we found three examples I will talk about two of them and then Fiona will go on with the last one uh, so you can see different cases that are possible into convert converting you may go to the next slide, Fiona. Thank you. So our first example is one that is based in New Brunswick. It's called Cooperative Ferme Tard Partagé, which would mean uh, shared land uh, in English. So uh, this farm it was founded in 1886 by a family and was um, uh, ended down <laughs> through the generations. Uh, expanding their, their activity, their diversifying their activities, going to dairy production, to beef cattle, and eventually to cereal crops, etc. Uh, and so this uh, farm has been uh, running from, uh, for a long time now. And in a few, a few years back, so in eight, uh, 2018, the father of the family wanted to uh, pass on his, far his farm to his family. And their ch it's his children chose to use the cooperative model uh, so that they could join with also other workers of the farm and to the ownership of the farm. And so they became a workers co cooperative, including the, uh, the, the, uh, the children, but also the father became a, uh, became a member so that he could collaborate with them for, uh, for the, the next years. And eventually, they plan on getting included other workers uh, as the uh, as the co-op expands, as the agricultural expand uh, together. And they are also transitioning right now to a more agro agroecological agriculture, 
And so they tend to go through uh, organic and establish links with direct consumers around them. And so they are also transitioning their business model and they can do it by uh, cooperative film tactage. And you can find more information on it if you wish on the by following the link we share the down the, the, the screen. We can go to the X. So, and another example we have for you is the Cooperative Pomicole du Lac des Deux Montagnes, uh, which is, as you can guess <laughs> by the images we put at the right, uh, they are uh, pro uh, alcohol producers. Uh, so the model they wanted to adopt, this is, uh, there are 22 producer members currently in the co-op. So with each and every one of them owns a, an aircorn, Car, I guess that's how we say it. Uh, and so they grow apples into their own business, but collectively they decided to acquire, to buy a business that was going to close uh, or was for sale. I don't know if it's, it was going to close, but it was for sale. And this business helps them with the, the packaging, the storage and the branding services. To, uh, for every one of these producer co-ops. So collectively they created the cooperative and the cooperative bought the private business and now they are using the services of the newly acquired business and they own it, <clears throat> but uh, they also, they also uh, control it. And so they decide uh, what they want to do with it and how the co-op can also help them um, enhance their own activities uh, on their own and so they bought uh, they bought the uh, the business in 2010 uh, 2010 and uh, that's it since then the co-op itself acquired in our in our card in another our card and they bought also by the co-ops the co-op by uh, bought sorry controlled and muscular warehouses and so these are all useful to every 22 producer members of the cooperatives. And they became, uh, well, this is a quite huge uh, cooperative in the Apple sector uh, in Quebec. Thank you, Fiona. I'll pass it to you. Thank you. Those are great examples. I'm going to jump into one more example for you today. Um, in this case, this is out on the West Coast on Vancouver Island. This is a multi-stakeholder multi co-op. Um, so if we remember those different types, this means that there are different types of um, members to, the, to this uh, co-op. And it's called the Lowbrenner Community Farm Co-op. Some of you might have heard about this one. Um, again, it, it was a family farm that worked uh, this land um, until about 2015. Um, and then the family donated the farm to um, a land uh, conservancy called TLC, the lovely, uh, lovely acronym there. Um, and in this at this point, um, there was a group of farmers who were sort of the volunteer stewards of this um, uh, land conservancy. Um, and uh, this is sort of uh, in an interim stage, and um, now this um, TLC has been transferred to Farm Folk City Folk, which some of you um, out on the West Coast might be familiar with. Um, and they have worked towards uh, transferring and transforming it into the Low Runner Community Farm Co-op. And in this case, um, we see a number, as I, as I mentioned, a number of different types of members and stakeholders. Um, we have a couple of different farms involved, um, Vitality Farms and Sweet Acres. Um, and then, um, like Jose has also uh, brought some examples forward where we see a real diversity um, offered by the, the, the different um, conversions, uh, where they're running CSAs, farm stands, working in the markets, also supplying restaurants, as well as the, um, the other membership, which is called the Homesteader Family. Um, and this, uh, this farm is really working towards um, tackling um, food security issues in this uh, part of Vancouver Island. Um, so uh, these three examples that we have um, brought together right now, it's just to show you that this is happening here and now in Canada. Um, people are converting their farms or their agricultural businesses and industries um, in, into co-ops. Um, as Jose said, uh, Canada has a very long history of um, co-ops. 
Um, uh, and in many cases, in that sort of very um, uh, colonial sort of sense, we have um, a strong co-ops as a part of um, our sort of um, uh, development of the West, uh, for example, um, with the wheat pool, um, and then also in Quebec, we see that um, in the maple syrup industry, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a very strong agricultural movement that has deep, deep roots and deep, deep history. Um, but we wanted to show you some examples of how people are um, picking up and taking up the co-op movement today um, in terms of that succession planning moment um, and also thinking about the transfer of how, how um, agricultural businesses and uh, in, in industries can be transferred into co-ops in different kinds of ways, depending on who their members are or uh, who their members could be as well. So it's a pretty flexible model, I guess, is what we're also trying to highlight here. Let us now jump into um, some of the benefits and the challenges. Um, and first, I'm going to start talk about uh, co-ops in general. Um, and some of you may actually have experience uh, with um, either as members or as work workers or employees um, or as consumers of co-ops yourself. So, of course, you're going to bring some of that experience um, forward um, in your thinking about co-ops. Um, but uh, if we just start to think a little bit more generally about the co-op model, um, co-ops can really help um, people to take control of that economic future because they are not owned by any shareholders. They're in fact owned by the, the members, the people who use the co-op, um, uh, and, and not some absent shareholders who could you know, be living anywhere in Canada or be living anywhere really in the world if we're talking about multinational corporations. This means that um, that economic and social benefits can often then have a huge role to play right in those communities where they are established. So that idea of the local economy can really be further generated um, when we pick up and use the co-op model. Um, then we can also see how those profits then are not exiting out of communities to those shareholders, but in fact staying right in communities and being returned to those members, those very same people who have um, seen the, uh, the, the economic activity of the co-op be moving forward and growing. So um, I, I started this sort of high level way, just, um, just so that we can, and then we will, we will be taking it um, and applying it in the agricultural sector, and then we'll also be applying it um, in this uh, conversion space as well. A little bit deeper into this, um, again, we're in this co-op model um, uh, space around um, some of the benefits. As I said, um, these are member oriented. And so this not just means that all the profits are obviously be, um, uh, are being realized within and for the membership, um, uh, but they're also working towards um, maximizing those members' needs as well. And there's a direct connection between the members' needs and the co-op itself. Um, the second one is around democracy. Um, democracy can be practiced not just in um, um, elections for our municipalities or our provinces or our, our um, federal government, but in fact, um, here we have um, an opportunity for participatory democracy right within businesses. Um, and how we see this represented in this uh, classic line within the co-op movement, which is one member, one vote. So it doesn't matter how much money you may have invested in it, um, uh, you will have equal the amount of say as any other member within the co-op. Um, and this is, a, again, a really big difference uh, between a more shareholder examples, where if you have more money invested in it, you now see your uh, voice be much louder. In a co-op movement, it doesn't matter how much money you have invested in it, it's one member, one vote in a democratic process. We also see that they are independent. Um, so this means that each co-op decides what they, um, uh, their membership and also has their own governance structures as well. Um, uh, so we see that the, the governance, so the board of directors is created out of that membership. So again, making a direct link between um, 
not just that economic link and those needs links, but in fact, the governance as well. Another benefit is around that patronage. And as I said, you know, uh, these are businesses, they are making profits, and so then we see that member, that um, patronage coming back directly to those members. So this is again where we would see um, if members have more invested in the co-op, they will see their economic and their patronage be in fact higher than others. So it's again, it's not based on uh, your, your say or your vote is not based on how much you've invested, but your patronage is in fact based on how much, so that economic return. We also see this idea of risk mitigation. And so by this joint effort of people coming together, um, we can see that we create an economic power where um, if we were thinking about doing things perhaps on our own, we may not, in fact, um, be able to sort of take those economic or social or family risks. But when we come together collectively, um, we can see though that risk shared. And then finally, around that uh, limited liabilities piece, um, again, it means that uh, members uh, are limited to how much they have contributed. So you you um, won't, won't lose it all, I guess, is, is one of the big um, be, uh, benefits, again, in that sort of risk mitigation piece. Of course, you're all thinking, but <laughs> um, there, of course, are, I just wanted to also, of course, acknowledge that. Um, some people want to have the control, and um, if that is where people want to be, if they want to have all the say and all of the, um, the control, then maybe a co-op might not be for you because you want to be able to make all those decisions. In a co-op model, this um, is a co uh, often a collective decision-making process. Um, again, depending on what the bylaws look like, um, this could be still very hierarchical kinds of decision-making, um, but the um, but if you want to be sort of a top dog person and making all the decisions, then um, uh, co -op, the co-op model might take some um, stretching of how you uh, usually make decisions. Um, another big challenge is around capitalization. Um, Co-ops can have a difficult time raising capital because um, there are no investors necessarily. The investors are the members of the co-op. Co-ops, of course, can access loans as any other business, but if you're thinking about that sort of angel investor or the, um, the venture capital invent, uh, investor, then often these people aren't really attracted to the co-op model. Again, because they don't have as much um, voice within it as perhaps they might like. Another big challenge of the co-op model is around awareness. And um, this is in the general public, the business community, uh, potential members. People don't necessarily know about the co-op model and or they don't necessarily know how to start up or manage or grow a co-op. So this um, awareness piece can be um, a pretty big challenge in the co-op model. Hand in hand with that is around capacity. Um, so because again, co-ops are governed by their members, we can sometimes see that um, there can be some limits with those members and the membership um, of their personal capacity to be able to govern or make um, the, you know, the big decision um, decisions that need to be made. Um, uh, Co-ops can't go out and then cherry pick. Um, other people who may have that knowledge, they have really have to work towards training up their, um, their membership to make sure that they've got the right people who can then um, uh, uh, work on those, um, those, big, those big issues. So that capacity building is a big, it can be a big challenge for co-ops. And then finally, um, the equally distributed economic responsibility. So again, if there is a loss, then all, every individual patronage will be then reduced as a result of that loss in order to compensate. Um, so again, everyone feels it, um, not just key people um, within uh, a co-op model. I'm going to jump into our more specific um, uh, space that we've been talking about, which is the conversion from one type of business into a co-op 
as part of perhaps a succession planning process. Um, here again, um, we can see some um, real, some real, very real challenges. Again, that capitalization piece can be a big one. Um, within the agricultural industry, of course, there can be some very large capital, capital intensive um, um, uh, items. And this can again be uh, difficult to try to raise the funds for that. Sometimes um, it can uh, be even tricky to, um, uh, at, uh, to do the education process with um, potential lenders of funding because they may not be familiar with the co-op model themselves. Um, again, we see that lack of awareness piece. Um, this is not necessarily known by everyone, and so perhaps in, in your personal network where you are trying to shift um, to or convert your business to a co-op, or you're trying to be involved in a conversion process, so your lawyer or your accountant or your financial advisor or um, may not in fact know very much about the co-op model and so you're finding yourself having on a double uh, learning curve both with yourself and taking that um, the, the um, yeah. specialty people on that, um, that uh, journey with you. And then um, another challenge can be um, just around doing that business differently and so um, you know, thinking about things in a much in a more de democratic process again depending on what the bylaws have been designed to uh, reflect can require new skills and um, and you know, new ways of uh, seeing those values come forward however I do want to definitely land in a space that um, uh, is uh, around some of the advantages of um, these of conversions certainly um, co-ops can own land and so then farmers can farm um, in um, uh, uh, context in Canada where we see the great um, uh, sell-off of the nation in lots of ways um, to multinational corporations um, and also farming and land um, for farming being, um, becoming uh, at a very high price um, depending on where it's located um, this can just put uh, the opportunity to farm out of reach even for those people as you probably know um, uh, uh, for 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 many um, and so co-ops and the bringing together of people co-ops can then work um, to buy that land and also to um, create those businesses in a more collective manner um, um, and thus um, opening up that sort of that opportunity um, the second one I want to mention also is around um, there is a huge co-op network out there already of very mature co-ops in the agricultural sector um, um, that have gone through lots of um, growing pains themselves if in fact a long time ago but now in fact are as I said a mature co-ops themselves and are looking to support new co-ops in, agri in, agri in the agricultural um, industry. In addition to that, there are great um, provincial associations for co-ops um, who are um, uh, super knowledgeable on how to develop co how, how to develop co-ops, how to do those conversion processes as well. Um, so there's a huge ecosystem of people out there who know how to do this. Um, so if you're even thinking about this at all, then um, we, there there are people out there who can help. Um, and then finally, I just want to land around in that succession phase. So the owner of the family farm, as Jose pointed out previously in one of our examples, can be a part of this process as a way of um, uh, gently exiting um, the, the, the business or allowing more time for that transitioning moment um, to sort of spread out while, um, while perhaps the, uh, the individual owner um, or business is looking to transition out but maybe isn't 100% there yet and also for new people to be transitioning in. So um, this succession phase with a co-op uh, model can really be embraced in um, um, a lot of really creative ways.
We definitely want to leave you today with um, uh, some opportunities to learn more. I hope that we have um, whet your appetite, so to speak, um, with some ideas about how you can think about uh, the co-op model in um, uh, succession planning or in a conversion uh, moment from one type of business structure to another. And um, we've got a ton of great resources out there. Um, some uh, for regionally specific areas, um, others at a more national level, um, and we would be happy uh, to help you out with that. And I'm sure that um, our PowerPoint can be shared where you could just get the direct links as well. Um, but at this point, um, if you have any questions at all, of course, um, feel free to contact either Jose or I, or head on over to the Co-op Convert um, website. Um, there will be uh, a ton of great resources emerging there as well um, in the next um, uh, couple of months as we really ramp up that website a little bit more. But we're really happy to have, um, as I said, whet your appetite to the idea of um, a conversion to a co-op. And we welcome questions at this point. Thank you for being there. I see where it's not so many people, so maybe we could uh, all have our cameras on uh, and participate in a kind of discussions. We had some questions from Heather, thank you. Uh, and so I think we can begin uh, with answering those questions, Fiona, what do you think? Maybe I can answer the first one real quickly about why do you think co-ops are so prom uh, more prominent in Quebec? Uh, Heather says we find the same thing with farm management clubs. Uh, and one of the main reason I would, I would say to that is uh, mostly historical and cultural, of course, but historical, uh, since uh, may, maybe some of you know Desjardins, which is the, the, a great credit, big credit union uh, that started at the beginning of the, the 19, uh, 1901, in fact, uh, in Quebec. And so this is one of the, this model has been expanded throughout the province of Quebec and helped out a lot a lot, lot of cooperatives to begin their activities throughout the different regions of Quebec. And so that created kind of a cooperative culture. And then the, the uh, how do you say that? This led to more and more co-ops. And it's still more, it's now more in our culture, I may say, uh, to uh, start co-ops. And there is also a, a whole network of co-op experts that are there to help and promote and um, uh, well essentially help create the creation of co-ops and promote the model so that's why i think uh, there are still more co-ops now and as you know if something is more frequent around you you may think more about it as an option so that's what we see there's clusters of co-ops there are some models that are repeated throughout regions and throughout the time so that, that would be my answer to that. Uh, another question I saw is, what are the first steps you should take if you're interested in starting a co-op? I think Fiona, you answered quite some of them into the, uh, uh, the chat uh, window, but one thing for sure is you should contact uh, an expert, a cooperative expert. There is a, NAS, a cooperative association in every province in Canada. And so they do have the expertise to help you, whatever the sector of activities you're in. So if you're in agricultural activities, they will be help, able to help you through the co-op conversion process uh, and find out um, uh, some people that can help you more specifically around the agricultural sector and in conjunction with the co-op model. So this is very uh, the first step you should uh, you should take if you're interested into creating a cooperative or transforming your business into a cooperative or your family farm uh, through a business. Fiona, would you like to add something? Sure, just, just to also add to Jose's points, uh, there is, uh, there's another organization called Co-op Zone, 
and they are a group of co-op developers just speaking to those folks who uh, know exactly what they're doing when it comes to developing co-ops and um, hurdling those challenges um, that transition could be um, and they they know exactly what to do in um, in your province um, and how to how to make that uh, process as smooth as possible so co-op zone is another one and um, I put it in the chat but I can also pull the link for you as well there was another question about joining an existing co-op. If you're into, if you're actually a producer, for example, you want to join a co-op. One thing you may find is exactly your provincial associations may have a list of these cooperatives that exist in your sector and may inform you to whatever occasions you have if you want to join as a member of a of an existing existing co-op. Um, you. Can be you 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 can be surprised sometimes to know that some businesses are in fact co-ops because uh, it's not always um, clearly visible. But when you begin to look look around, you can see that uh, in fact more businesses are co-ops than you may think at first. Um, so that would be it. If you are, if anyone has uh, questions popping on, just go ahead and put it into uh, the channel, no, uh, no problem for that. And if you want more explanations than what we, uh, uh, than our answers do provide, well, please feel free to ask for more details. I also just wanted to very quickly add that um, in addition to this recording, we can post your, your PowerPoint presentation on farmtransitionguide.ca. We can make sure that all of those uh, links that you have in your PowerPoint presentation are hyperlinked. So that way, if you are interested in either making the conversion to a co-op or if you are thinking of joining one, you can get that additional information. I just wanted to chime in really quickly on that. Thank you. Uh, one uh, one other question that was asked is uh, by Heather also for co-ops who typically leads the business functions like planning, financial management, etc. Is it the members or is it a third party that is typically brought in? Uh, the answer is not uh, one and only answer. <laughs> in fact, uh, what we see is most of the time when the cooperative is beginning and is just starting its activities, sometimes it's, it, it begins small. And so the members may be invited at first to lead everything about it, but they can get help from uh, co-op experts around them that can help them. Uh, there are lawyers uh, that can help with that, accountants that know the co-op models and can help you throughout the process. Uh, there are different experts in that way that can help you out. But as the co-op grows, most of the time they will hire, hire a, uh, how do you say that, Fiona? CEO? No. <laughs> yes, that would be it. So they would, they, they, they uh, mostly hire a CEO to get uh, all these activities done. Just like other businesses, um, folks would have uh, their role and title and their job descriptions um, and some of those can look very, uh, you know, in that very sort of standard or classical kind of hierarchy or they can be landing a little more flat depending on what kind of uh, bylaw structure you have or what kind of business you ultimately want to have as well. Um, so people have jobs, of course, and job descriptions. And um, certainly, in as Jose said, in that moment of converting to a co-op, there may be some um, outside help. But then, of course, um, just like other businesses, people begin to do those jobs internally um, based on their expertise or their interests. Um, sometimes there might be some third party um, uh, consultancies hired in order to do some specific work. Um, but for the most part, the co-op does the work and the, the people who are um, the employees of the co-op they will can carry on with their jobs. Uh, one question from Wendy, I think uh, worth answering uh, before the presentation finishes. I think we have to stop like in no uh, in a few minutes. Uh, is about the uh, Wendy says our experience in Atlantic Canada is that there are almost no inter intermediaries like accountants and lawyers who are familiar in any way with co op conversions, nor can we find resources for them. Are you aware of anything? Uh, 
Fiona, I think you are familiar with the Atlantic provinces and the co-op movement into uh, these places. So I'll let you go, maybe. Yes, and um, uh, Wendy um, is a longtime co-op um, developer and is actually one of the um, provincial association um, uh, uh, CEOs. Um, so she is somebody with a massive amount of knowledge. Um, and this is exactly what um, uh, Co-op Convert is going to be working towards, is to be creating some resources for some of those folks, um, those intermediaries, that ecosystem, those people that um, we know people are always turning to. Um, we know for sure that the accountant, the financial advisor, and the lawyer, these are the three biggies. Um, and um, helping to build out their knowledge is a really key component um, to the work that we're doing here with Co-op Convert. Um, but to your point, your question exactly, uh, Wendy, at the moment, um, Co-op Convert hasn't developed it anything, um, but it is a hope that we have. Um, and um, part of that will be also to scan around and see if there is any other kinds of um, tools that have been developed um, in different parts of Canada or perhaps um, to our neighbors to the south, which we could then uh, do some adaptive kind of work. Um, so unfortunately, not the best answer for that one for you, Wendy. Um, but uh, our, our hope is to be able to start to deliver on that. Um, because we know that those are key people that really um, can make or break um, even people uh, knowing about the co-op model or even thinking about um, uh, you know doing that transition to um, uh, they're transitioning their business to um, a co-op model. I've just had you. Uh, so so you know I've just had there's Cooperative de Développement Régional Acadie, which is intended for French uh, population, but they do have a lot of expertise and they can help uh, everyone. So uh, feel free also to contact them uh, if you wish. I know they they are based in New Brunswick, but they can they do a lot of work uh, in other provinces around. So they you can check their uh, their uh, website. And I know uh, Fiona and Jose, you uh, put your email addresses at the end of your PowerPoint presentation. Perhaps you want to put it in the chat. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I want to thank you both for taking the time to share your knowledge and your expertise on a topic that um, is really new and exciting um, as far as uh, what we can do as far as transition planning. I think this is going to be really beneficial. Thank you to those of you who attended and for bearing with me on the technical side of things. I really appreciate your patience. Don't forget to visit farmtransitionguide.ca to see the recording of this presentation as well as the other webinars taking place today. Follow Farm Management Canada on social media, hashtag FTA day. Um, we wanna share your stories, we wanna hear from you. So please let us know what you've learned today. And um, thank you for joining us. This is an important step in transition planning and we hope you enjoy the rest of Farm Transition Appreciation Day. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.